We would rather it be fiction with a name like The Land That Time Forgot or a sad tale of historical injustice now decades old, but it's real and it's really from 2010 and therefore almost incomprehensibly racial. In our fourth story, a Mississippi school board dictating what race its middle school students must be in order to run for student elections. Today, after an emergency session, the school board reversed these practices and procedures, which have been in place for more than 30 years. All that time, Nettleton Middle School in Nettleton, Mississippi, has designated which class positions were open to white children and which ones were open to African-American children. For instance, only white children could run for eighth grade president, while black children and only black children could run for eighth grade vice president. From a school memo obtained exclusively by NBC News, it does not end there. Note that in all three grade levels, six, seven, and eight, class president is reserved for white children. In the sixth and seventh grades, there is only one out of four positions available for black students, reporter and secretary treasurer, respectively. NBC News also obtained a copy of what purports to be the high school's rules on homecoming positions. There will be one white and one black girl nominated from each homeroom, grades nine through 11. Within hours of the story appearing on MSNBC today, the Nettleton School Board in emergency session voted to reverse the policy, releasing a statement from Superintendent Russell Taylor, which reads in part, after being notified of a grievance regarding upcoming student elections at Nettleton Middle School, research was conducted that evidenced that the current practices and procedures for student elections have existed for over 30 years. It is belief, the belief of the current administration that these procedures were implemented to help ensure minority representation and involvement in the student body. It is our hope and desire that these practices and procedures are no longer needed. Therefore, beginning immediately, student elections at Nettleton School District will no longer have a classification of ethnicity. It is our intent that each student has equal opportunity to seek election for any student office. Perhaps it originated from a good place about 1980, but it also completely ignored students who might be of other ethnic origins, plus those who did not neatly fit into black or white. And the policy finally reviewed because of a parent of one of these children decided to speak up. Brandy Springer's four children are of mixed race. Springer's eighth grade daughter had been told that she could not run for school reporter because that was reserved for black students. She was classified as white. Before the Nettleton policy was reversed today, the Springer family had moved to nearby Plattersville, Mississippi, so the children could attend a different school. I'm not sure I would put my kids back in a school system where um, the school officials have this attitude. Even if they change uh, the policies due, due to this, um, the attitude hasn't changed. Someone thought that this was okay up until now. Let's turn to Associate Professor of Politics and African American Studies at Princeton University, also a contributor to The Nation magazine and to MSNBC, Melissa harris Lacewell. Professor, good evening. Good evening. It's hard to know where to start on this, but I guess your overall <laughs> reaction should come first. I got to say, I, I, I hate to do this. It's not, you know, you have to excuse my language here, but really the only thing I could think when I heard this story was the song of the, of the iconic late Nina Simone. Mississippi, God damn. I mean, <laughs> really, it, um, this one for me was uh, pretty tough to hear, uh, in part because the one thing that I think uh, many folks have held on to in the Obama moment is the idea that, that despite all the other racial ugliness that is going on, that the Obama generation, the generation coming of age with an African-American president and a uh, Latina on the Supreme Court and a woman as Secretary of State, that they're just going to see the world differently. Uh, and so to know that it was being enforced as a matter of policy uh, for them to connect leadership with race, uh, I think is, is really sort of going to the very heart of what we hoped was not happening in America anymore. The school board's apparent rationale that this policy existed, or at least was established to ensure minority representation, that is how to go about achieving such a goal, even if we're looking at this from the prism of 1980. I mean, whatever the intent was, surely setting up just a few student government positions open to blacks would only guarantee that their representation would always remain a minority one, would it not? Uh, sure, and yet I think, you know, again, because of the context, I think we want to be careful. It is possible that at the moment that this policy and, and even the homecoming policy mm -hmm. went into effect, it's possible that that represented progress. I mean, I, I know it's, it's very hard mm -hmm. for us to imagine that from the position of 2010, but it is possible that at some moment we were at such a bad place in this community that setting aside could quite 
quite possibly have been a fight. I mean, my bet is if we looked back in the archives of, of those student government, I mean, excuse me, student council meetings, uh, that in fact we would find that that school board had to fight just to get those set asides. Now, that said, it is inexplicable why uh, in 2010, the leadership of that school board and of that school, many of whom uh, are people of color, mm -hmm. had not moved to change the policy before this moment. Is it, when you think about this, possible that this is the only thing like this out there in a school system or in some other facet of American life at this point when we see such an extraordinary example? Even if it was just left there to rot in 1980 and nobody thought about the meaning of it till 2010. Well, you know, what's extraordinary to me, in part, is that it was um, the question of a biracial student mm -hmm. who um, opened this up. And the reason that's extraordinary is if we know the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, that is the case that established separate but equal in the United States. It was a train case. Homer Plessy was a Creole of color from New Orleans, Louisiana, who was so racially ambiguous, in fact, so sort of white in his visual appearance, that he had to go to the conductor and say, you've got to throw me off the train because in fact I am crossing the color line. So when the Supreme Court made the Plessy decision at the dawn of the 20th century, they were deciding not only that separate but equal would be the law of the land, they were also deciding that one drop of black blood would also make one black going into the 20th century. And it, it redefined or, or sort of solidified the definition of race. So it's fascinating that once again, here at the 21st century, we once again have these people right on the borderlands of race and identity who are calling into question what we even mean by black and white and race in America. But undoubtedly, the most important forms of racial segregation in America are not about school boards and they're not about who can be class president. They're about the fact that our schools themselves are mostly racially segregated mm -hmm. in too many places in this country. Professor Melissa Harris-Lacewell of Princeton and MSNBC, great thanks.